Hello, arty peoples, and welcome to another episode of Jerry's Live. My name is Emmy Klein, and I am your host this evening. And today, I have a very fun watercolor show planned for us today. I'm very excited. Um, so, before we officially jump into the lesson plan, I did want to just remind you guys, if you are interested in anything that I'm using on the show today, make sure to go to the website, jerrysartorama.com, and in the search bar at the top, type in today's class code, which is JL273. Uh, so JL273, and that will bring up the teacher's cart that should have everything that I'm using today. So, now we can get into the fun stuff. I am going to be doing a watercolor landscape. Um, so I wanted to get kind of go through the entire process of how I go from selecting a photo reference and how I kind of tweak that photo reference to suit the needs of what I am looking to do as far as a watercolor landscape. Um, because let's be honest, every time I take photos while I'm out and about, I'm not thinking of how I'm going to turn it into a painting. I'm just capturing the moment and I'm capturing those memories. So uh, sometimes my photo references aren't perfect. So uh, I am going to be doing this right here, so this is the image we are going to eventually end up with. And um, just so you do understand, let's start from the beginning though. The photo reference. So uh, on the table here I have my photo reference. Let me actually get this out of the way. So this is the original photo, which I know my amazing moderators, Amanda and Frida, will be uh, popping this link into the chats for you guys to check out if you guys want to follow along with this lesson plan and paint this image. So, um, and actually with the tweaked version, I can probably pop that into our Jerry's Live Facebook group so you guys don't have to adjust the imagery like I did here. Uh, but this is the original photo. Now, as you can see, um, no, obviously I, I made it bigger so you guys can see it better on camera. Uh, but my uh, watercolor block that I'm going to be using, the New York Central watercolor block, um, is long and skinny. Uh, this is a 4x10. I love the long and skinny kind of format. I think it's very satisfying as far as compositions are concerned, especially when it comes to landscape. So I love this size. But clearly, my image is not long and skinny. So the very first thing that I'm going to do to this image is bring it into like a photo editing software. Any software will do, you know, not a big deal. Um, I happen to use Photoshop, but I crop my image to be, and again, remember, I've made this bigger so you guys can see, but this is the right ratios. Uh, so if I have, um, let me actually pull it down just a little bit so you guys can really see. There we go. Uh, so this is the right ratio. I uh, just made it a little bit bigger for you to see. So this is essentially going to be the size of my canvas, uh, of my watercolor block. And so I can now move this image around and tweak it wherever I need it to be so I can really zoom in. If I really love this one little uh, air, hot air balloon, I can really zoom in there or I can zoom out as much as possible because, you know, I got this entire image to work with, you know? So, as you can see, I did a line straight down the middle. So, when it comes to putting together your composition, a rule that's really, really great, especially as a beginner, if you're not familiar with how to set things up, uh, a rule of thirds. So, for the most part, especially with landscapes, you don't really want your landscape to land straight in the middle. Now, the, your horizon line is what I'm talking about. Uh, horizon line is technically where the sky meets the earth. Uh, now you can see I have a mountain in the background, so technically that's that's earth, but it's so far back in that uh, lamp, kind of in the air, you know, what's the atmosphere uh, perspective? That's the word I was looking for. Atmospheric perspective that it almost disappears, and I like that. So I don't really count that as land. This right here is pretty much putting my horizon line straight smack in the middle. Now when I'm talking about rule of thirds, I'm talking about dividing it into three sections and then having your horizon line land either on the top half of that third or the bottom half of that third. So I did both, right? So this is the one where it kind of lands a little bit lower and I get more of that sky and then this is the one where it lands a little bit higher and I get more of the ground. 
Um, so it gives it a little bit more of an interesting kind of perspective and divides your canvas not smack in half and it gives it a little bit more visual interest. Um, so I decided that I liked this better. Uh, the reason why I decided that I liked this better is because the sky gives you a really great calm place for your eye to rest. As an artist, uh, we do have to kind of incorporate that. So this gets real busy down here and then this is where your eye can rest. And it still has points of interest going throughout it, but where this right here to my eye was really busy. Also, I didn't want to paint all these rocks, not gonna lie. <laughs> Sometimes as artists, we can do that too. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I thought visually I liked this better. Now, the rule of thirds does not just go horizontally, it also goes vertically. So when it comes to rule of thirds, a really great thing to do is where those thirds kind of intersect, you put points of interest. So uh, right here, I could put like a little house or something. Um, you know, there's really nothing up here. Uh, so what I did was I moved things around. It doesn't have to be in every single one of these little corners, but these are really great areas to have points of interest. So I took the balloons that I think that were like right here-ish and I just kind of shifted them over and these, I shifted them, they used to be right about here and I shifted them over here. Uh, now granted, if you really look at this image, the background is a little funky, like I'm just going to ignore that and just use this for the reference of the balloons. But I didn't put it in every single one of those corners, I just put it in two and I put it on the opposite side so it kind of balances it out, you know? Um, so. Now that I got my composition laid out the way that I like it, I got my rule of thirds, I got points of interest on the, the verticals as well, I tweaked the colors because I thought, honestly, it's got a little orange. It's a little orange. Uh, so, you know, this might have just been my printer, whatever it may be. I, it, the actual reference photo tends to lean a little bit more towards the orange. So I did tweak the colors just a little bit and I brought them back down closer to the blues. Um, so you're not actually completely stuck with the colors that you originally have in your imagery. You can tweak them a little bit. Um, now I didn't tweak them a ton, but that's what how I went through the whole process of going from this is my reference photo, which Fun fact, if you guys are looking for great reference photos, uh, the one that I got was off of, I believe, unsplash.com. There's unsplash.com and um, Pixabay are the two that I usually use. They are royalty-free images. If you just Google search royalty-free imagery, you can usually come up with a couple different websites uh, so that you can use those images in your artwork and not have any legal issues when it comes to that. So this is off of a royalty-free image. I have every right to use this image according to the person who took this photo. So that's also important. But from here, I have to then transfer it onto my block, right? So I did end up just printing it. And this is a trick that you can do if you are, especially a beginner. Um, I printed it to the exact same size as my block. So when I'm transferring from here to my block, I don't have to scale anything up or down. I just have to copy what I see. Now, I did already do that. <laughs> Cause I didn't want to sit here and doodle this the entire time. There's a lot of little detail lines and you guys would be sitting here watching me draw the entire time. Um, so as you can see, I got just basic lines of placement of everything kind of laid down of where everything lands. Now you can also see on the balloon specifically, if I tilt this, it's got a little shiny, right? That's masking fluid. Because everything I'm gonna be using here is just kind of basic uh, art supplies when it comes to watercolors. There's not a ton of anything super special with I think the exception of this. This is the one thing that is a little bit um, more uh, kind of not a beginner thing that most people don't know about this until they all of a sudden hear about masking fluid. So I have one last little balloon here that I wanted to fill in for you guys, but everything else here is already masked off. Uh, and I just wanted to quickly go through how I do that. Now this is the masking fluid that I'm using. This is the Turner 
uh, masking fluid. It is liquid latex, essentially. If you do have a latex allergy, I believe Pabio is the one that has one that is latex free. Now I will say uh, when it comes to that, uh, Pabio also has one that is permanent. I know, Katie's face is like, why would they do that? I don't know why they would do that. It drives me crazy because I used it and then I couldn't get it off. Um, permanent masking fluid. I don't know why it exists. I'm sure there's a reason. If you know the reason, put it in the chats, please, because I am so curious and I have not figured it out myself. Uh, but make sure you do not get the permanent one because it does not remove like it's, I'm gonna show you how to do this in the, the later on in the show. Um, but if you do have a latex or rubber kind of allergy, Pabio does have one that is latex free and better for people with that kind of issue. Uh, so, excuse the, uh, the booger here. So this, because it is essentially liquid latex, as soon as it dries, it is like a liquid latex. It's, it's sticky, um, but it's kind of got that almost like rubbery kind of consistency. That will absolutely stay in your brushes. <laughs> so if you want to use brushes that are specifically designed for masking fluid, uh, that's what I included this. Uh, I have the pack of, I believe it's 10. Uh, they come in the fine point, the four round, like I'm showing here. And there's also a flat uh, version as well that comes in that pack. So you get five of each. Uh, these are cheap little throwaway brushes. The other thing I have seen is people dipping the bristles of their brush into dishwashing fluid to kind of act as like a barrier. Now you do want to let the dishwashing fluid completely dry before you then use your brush, but it will kind of help you to save your bristles. The one thing I will absolutely tell you not to do is to use your Kalinske Sables with masking fluids. These are not cheap brushes, they are amazing brushes. Treat them with respect. Don't dip them into your liquid latex because they are gonna die a horrible death. So, that being said, I'm going to take my masking fluid brush and just kind of dip it in there, get a little bit on my brush, and then uh, more or less paint in the lines. Um, now, I do wanna make sure that I don't get outside the lines, and if I do get outside the lines, the only way to fix that is to let it fully dry then remove it and start again. <laughs> Don't try to wipe it up as it's drying because you are still gonna have some of that still left behind um, and it's not going to remove all of it if you just kind of like wipe it up with your finger kind of a thing. Um, so here, let's kind of put this back here so you can see. Yeah, so I'm just kind of filling in the lines I had made here with my little balloon and there's a little dot here just for like the little basket that's down there. So now that it's completely masked off and it really does not take long for this to dry. Even if you put like a pretty big blob of it on there, it should be dry within like 30 minutes to an hour at the very most. Um, so this will, all of these are dry and that's perfect because I'm gonna be actually doing the top here. Um, but that should be dry well before we even end the show. On dry paper. On dry paper, yes. Don't put this on wet paper. You you want masking fluid on bone dry paper. Thank you, Katie. <laughs> so as you can see, I did my outlines here. And the other thing I wanted to note is if you are uh, doing a sketch beforehand, uh, the best thing to do when you are just filling in that, like getting the sketch lines, before you start watercoloring, I tend to hit it with a uh, just a kneaded eraser. I almost said rubber cement pickup, that's not the right tool. Uh, a kneaded eraser, so this is just a soft eraser that doesn't erase really harshly. It, I tend to just kind of dab it on my lines because I don't want to fully erase it. I just want to pick up the majority of the darkness so that when I watercolor on top of it, you don't see it a ton through the, the watercolor. Also watercolor on top of these graphite lines tends to lock them in. So you can't really erase them after your watercolor is done. Now, do we have a question? No, but I did Google the permanent masking fluid. Yeah, and is there One a of the benefits of it is that you can mix a wash with it so that you have a colored masking fluid that then goes down and you've got huh. the colored masking fluid, which is there permanently, but then if you go over it with another wash, 
it, it beads stays. off. Because oh, okay. So masking. permanent masking fluid you can mix in with That's your colors. Cool. That's really cool. I've never tried that personally. I think I'm going to have to now. <laughs> Thank you, Frida. I appreciate for the info. All right. So now that I have my masking fluid down and I'm not actually really going to be touching this. So it's, yes, it is technically still wet, but I'm not touching this area. So it's okay. Uh, I am going to just do my first initial wash on the sky. Now, when it comes to landscapes, and let me kind of pull this down so you guys can see a little bit better. Um, especially with watercolors, you have to work from light to dark. You have to save your light areas. Uh, that's just the name of the game when it comes to watercolors because if you darken something, there's only so much it might be able to lift off, but you will never get back to that pure white. So that being said, in my image up here, it, it tends to be nice and yellow right here. And then it goes almost kind of red and then a little bit of purple right over here and then nice and blue here. And then between the blue and that kind of yellow, there's almost like a divide of white that kind of just floats through. Now it's really soft, so I don't want harsh lines. So I got my watercolor brushes here and actually I'm going to grab my watercolors to get them set up. So I actually am using the Turner set of 18. Um, now when I am doing uh, pieces of art like this, now I'm only using a few colors, uh, seven to be exact. The seven that I'm using are upside down in my palette. Uh, when I have my tubes of paint like this and I'm going through um, like a painting, every time I use a color, I tend to flip it upside down. So that way I know I've used that in my piece. So that way I can keep track of if I need more of that color, I know which one to grab. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to be using the Permanent Lemon, the Permanent Gamboge, the Pyrrol Red, Dioxazine Violet. <laughs> I did it! <laughs> I, get, I have to hear Katie's voice in my head going, Dioxazine! Uh, it's, it it's just a word I struggle with. I, I don't know why I can't say that word unless I hear it said somewhere else. So I have to actually have Katie's voice in my head. Yeah, this is, this is where I'm living my life now. Anywho, uh, so I'm using the Dioxazine Violet and the Ultramarine Blue. Then I have the Olive Green and my Yellow Ochre. So those are the seven colors I'm going to be using to create this piece. Um, remember, I'm saving my whites, so I don't need white, and I'm not going as dark as black, so I don't need that either. Um, now I have already squeezed out the colors that I'm using in my Soho uh, Airtight palette here. So I got all, all of them here and I'm going to attempt to try and keep this as on camera as possible, but we have long and skinny Im images here. So it's a little bizarre. Um, actually, let me kind of try to keep everything on camera. There we go. That'll, that'll help a little bit. <laughs> so because I want to start with, um, the background is essentially, I want to work my way from the background to the foreground. Uh, the background I want nice and light and bright, and I also want it very soft. So the first, very first thing I'm gonna do is I have a bucket of water here. Uh, just plain old bucket of water, nothing special about it. Uh, I'm going to get the entire sky wet. Now, the reason why I am very specifically using the New York Central watercolor block is because uh, this is a block. It is glued on all four sides. So no matter how much water I put on here, it's not going to buckle, which is amazing because if you've done watercolor and had your, your paper bow on you, uh, that's really, really hard to control your water and hard to control kind of the flow and kind of what it's doing. Now I am going to go over this little like mountain region, not completely down to the bottom, but just the top of it because I want that to still also be nice and soft and you'll see why in just a second. So let me grab a little bit of this lemon yellow, not a ton, and I'm just gonna pop this in the corner because remember up here, I'm gonna keep it nice and white, right? There we go. Let me actually pop this up a little forward. So, I don't want it super saturated because I don't want the eye to go straight to that uh, when it comes to um, looking at my image. I want that to be nice and soft, but I do want it more saturated on this side. So let me grab a little bit more of that yellow. 
that might have been too much. Now if it is too much, all I have to do is w get my brush uh, cleaned off in the water and then lift it back up, but because I'm, I'm okay with that, I can kind of spread it around just a little bit. Uh, and then I'm gonna kind of pop in the yellow, not at my horizon, but just slightly above, right? Again, nice and soft, everything's still wet, so all of my edges are soft, there's nothing harsh about my edges. And then I'm gonna grab a little bit of that pyrrol red, and I'm gonna pop it in. And this is why I masked off those balloons, because now I can go over the top of it and not worry about trying to paint around those little suckers, because that is very difficult. Right? All right, now I know this little corner is gonna be purple, so purple and red make a pretty purple, purpley red, and that's okay. Purple and yellow make mud. I know that because I've mixed purple and yellow together and it makes gross mud. Now, red and yellow make orange, right? So I'm gonna add a little bit of touch of orange here and there, kind of right where they are. I have literally just on my palette mixed the two of them together. Again, I'm not adding a ton of pigment. I still want it to be nice and soft, but I am seeing that my paper is drying just a little bit, so I am gonna get a little wet up here because I still want it nice and soft, right? Now, grab a little bit of that purple while that is wet and kind of pop that in here. Now, if I notice, I actually got my easy wiper and dry off my brush. If I notice that I don't like how saturated that reddish orange is, I can take my brush, get it completely pigment free, just slightly damp, and then kind of pick that up while it's still wet. I don't wanna overbrush this. I just wanna get one, maybe two brush strokes to where I can control what it's doing. Right, and I really like that pop of red. So now, I'm gonna go back up here, still keeping it nice and wet. I'm gonna bring in that ultramarine blue. I'm just going to dance it just across the top, bring it down maybe a little bit in there. And I'm not exactly copying the image, I'm just kind of going with what's happening on my, my uh, painting because I will say water has a mind of its own. Sometimes it's gonna flow wherever it's gonna flow and if I like what it's doing, then I'm gonna leave it. Oh, I have a little fuzzy. So I might pop that down a little bit further. All right. So now that my yellow is pretty dry, right? I am gonna take a little bit of that purple While it's mostly dry, I'm gonna dance it just across the top of that mountain. Right? So now I have just a couple of shadows popping over on that mountain. And if I decide that I really want that edge to be nice and soft, all I have to do is take a wet brush and just run it through here and soften that edge. And it's gonna, it is going to flow down into that, which is okay, because I'm gonna mostly be covering that up, um, but that will soften that edge. So that is the sky, for the most part. Again, if I wanna get more saturated, because I don't have to exactly copy what's going on here, I can, but um, I very much like how that's going. Now, for this part, you're gonna let it dry. Fully let it dry. We have a question? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, the original picture that you're using mm -hmm. is not to the same ratio as the block that you're using. It is. I mean, the original, the, the, original, the link, the... Oh, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um... Sorry, so, um, could you give a few tips on, like, the best way to get that to the this. correct ratio? How do you do it? So, the way that I do it, um, if you bring it into any kind of photo editing software, you should be able to crop it down to the right size. The way that I do it is I open that in Photoshop, because that's the, the software that I use. Uh, then I create a brand new, uh, I guess, what is it, image? File, file, that's a word. Uh, so I create a brand new file, 
at the size that my um, piece is. So this is four by 10, so I will create a four by 10 file. Then I drag and drop that image into that file, and then I can just move it around as much as I want to. I can then tweak it, I can then um, cut out part of the image and then copy it and then move it around where I need to, like I did with the balloons. Uh, I personally have been using Photoshop since the early 2000s, so <laughs> I've been using it for a very long time and I'm very familiar with it. Um, but if that is a software that you guys are interested in using, there are a million tutorials out there for you to use, um, but that just happens to be the one that I use. Um, I'm sure every program has like a million different ways of cropping things. I want to say probably you could do it on Canva too, and I know that's like a less expensive option. Yeah, too. Canva, you probably can as well. Yeah, crop it that way. But um, the other thing you can do is uh, if you really don't are not tech savvy, bring it to like FedEx Kinkos and go, hey, I have this picture. I would really love for you to print it and crop it to four by 10. <laughs> Bring the digital file. Bring the digital file, yes. Uh, which, because this is a um, digital download that you can find online, you could very easily also send them a link. They can download it that way. Um, they should be able to then take care of everything for you. Uh, if you really get a really awesome person who uh, is really excellent, they might even let you uh, kind of help tweak the photo. Um, by the help, I mean they'll turn the, the screen for you. They'll do all the work. And they'll go, does this look good? And then you can tell them to move it up or down or whatever it may be. Uh, but I've had FedEx Kinkos um, make, make good friends with them. They're good people. <laughs> um, but because I don't really want to wait for this to fully dry, I came prepared. Ha 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 ha. So um, I already did uh, this background here. Um, and it's already fully, I don't want to completely rub my hand against it because I don't want to get the oils on my fingers on there, but I can tell you that it is, it is bone dry. Um, so we can continue on with this painting. Um, now I'm going to stick with my larger brush because I have a smaller flat. I have a 12, I have a six, and then I have a five short round. Um, so this I'm going to use as like my details at the very end. Uh, I'm going to try and use my 12 flat for as long as possible. The reason why is because I want to do the big washes first and then kind of start getting into those smaller little sections where I uh, kind of create uh, the details without getting too detailed. Um, now, with that being said, when it comes to landscapes, and I cannot emphasize this enough, your detail matters. Um, if I were to make this little mountain back in the background here, extremely detailed, that level of detail needs to continue as you come up in the foreground. So if I decide that I don't want to have any of this be very detailed, and I just want like my upper balloons to be the, have the most detail, um, I whatever that plane of existence in my kind of landscape is, from there forward has to be detailed. Um, so if I decide that this little tiny balloon up here is going to be very detailed, all of these balloons better be too. Um, so like if I were to draw like all the little houses and stuff that is actually in this image, um, cause I can see them, all the little houses and everything that are in there. If I were to do that, all of the other detail should be there too. Because once you see that detail, you should be able to see everything that's closer to you, right? Um, because I don't wanna paint all of those little houses. I am not going to put that in. <laughs> Um, so I'm just going to kind of put that in as a plane of color um, without all of those specific little details. So as an artist, you absolutely have the right to edit that back down, um, specifically because if you, if you do put that detail in, all of the other detail needs to be there to, for it to make sense, you know? Um, so I'm trying to make sure that I'm still on camera here. Um, let me turn this sideways. All right, so now that I got my background, I am still working from my, um, my background to the foreground. So I am going to grab, this is where I'm gonna start putting in more pigment. So my background's nice and kind of, I, I want it to be um, kind of pushed back. And as you go further back, it gets more blue, um, which is funny because I will say in my initial piece here, uh, I kind of 
broke my own rule and I put too much pigment in this mountain. So I don't want to do that again because that then brings my horizon line straight in the middle. Uh, so <laughs> I want this to be pushed back into space, but I still want to have a little bit of detail of where the tops of the mount mountains are and maybe just a little bit more pigment on that yellow side um, just so we can kind of differentiate between the, the mountain and the sky. But I have to watch that because in my first initial one, I was very pigmented and it just definitely brought the horizon line up. Um, so I'm going in with ultramarine blue and I'm still being very light on the pigment. Um, again, if you need to have a little swatch sheet next to you, um, you can pull off one of these sheets and have it next to you or you can have a sketchbook with our, like a watercolor mixed media book next to you to where you can test the pigment load. Um, but I am going to, just along the top of this little mountain here, just touch in that blue. Now, I don't want just a line like that, right? So I'm going to kind of use the corner of my brush uh, and kind of dab it down. And then I'm going to continue it to get smaller and smaller as it gets further over to this side. And then kind of bring it in almost like it's little shadows. And all I'm doing is just little dabs, right? Uh, but I'm making sure the top of that little mountain gets definitely the harsh line. So this little line too. Right? And I think just a little touch of that, as I get further over here, I do want to kind of mix in more water so it kind of fades out to nothingness. Um, but I do want to kind of watch how much pigment I put in there. And just like that, my mountain range has a slight difference between the sky and the mountain. And I'm going to continue that over here. But I'm still keeping it nice and soft. Again, if I find that I've put too much down, just a clean wet brush, pick it right back up. Or even get those uh, the edges nice and soft. You can do that too. Now because uh, I did keep my lines kind of on the dark side here, just so you guys on camera can see it, um, that graphite line is now also helping me uh, to differentiate that. Now if you decide that you don't want to see that sketch whatsoever, just make sure that you erase it out more than I did. Um, but I just wanted to make sure that you guys could really see what was going on there. Now, for this side, I'm going to use a little bit of that gamboge, which is really, really pigmented. It's a very strong color, so a little goes a long way. <laughs> a little goes very, very far. So I barely touched into the pigments and it's gotten quite the saturation there. But I'm okay with that because I'm just going to just, again, just like I did with the blue, but this is like my highlight side almost, where the, the light's coming in kind of from this direction, right? And I'm just going to touch just a little bit here and there, and then I'm gonna start bringing it in over here. And then I'm gonna, just like I uh, faded it off here with the blue, I'm gonna fade it off with the, the gamboge this way. And not put in a ton. We'll say, yeah, I think that's about right. So I like that far more than I like my original one. <laughs> so um, now if we do have time at the very end, I can probably show you kind of how to lift the original one. I, I can probably show you how to lift a bit of those pigments out if you decide that you um, don't like as much as what you did. Um, there's a way to kind of bring it back a little bit. Now, again, as I go forward, I'm gonna add more pigments. That is a lot more, so I'm gonna kind of water that down just a little bit more. And as I spread it out, it'll kind of even out. So, I am not too concerned with what I'm kind of blobbing in. Um, and actually, if we go to that side camera, you guys may, might be able to see a little bit better of kind of how I blob this if I move things around here. There we go. Um, so, if I blob in, and I, I'm literally just kind of dabbing, right? With, if I'm trying to get a straight line, I use the, the sharp edge of that. If I'm just trying to get a little area, 
I use the corner of my flat brush, right? It's almost like having a ton of different brushes all in one. But that little mountain range is very, very blue. And I am just going to, again, I'm not being perfect, but because this area is already pretty dry, I don't, didn't have a ton of water on there, so it's, it dries pretty fast on me. Um, but I can get a nice sharp line on where it needs to be there. So I also need to bring that in. Now this is the area where, oh, I'm not even on camera, sorry. Uh, this is the area where all the town is, right? They have like all the little rocks and the little houses and stuff. I'm just going to one big brush stroke of blue and then we can kind of hint at shadows when we get later or get into the next kind of layer. So I'm more or less just building up my layers. I'm building up from my lights all the way down to a darker layer. And the darkest layers are probably going to be up front with these shadows here where you, they're real dark. So you get the most contrast, right? And then, just again, I'm going to kind of continue that blue and maybe bring it in a little bit down here. Again, I'm not being precise with it. I'm just kind of dabbing it around and having it dance all around my, um, my painting, right? Just to kind of indicate little shadows here and there because there are quite a few. <laughs> and again, this is why I decided, now there's a big chunk of dark here, if you guys can see. Um, so that I am going to just kind of block in because I can always darken this, but this is definitely, with all these different little shadows dancing around, this is why I chose to have such a big open sky area because that is a lot going on and it gets really busy. It really does. So to have those little areas of rest is very important for the viewer. So I am going to just dance this blue in just a little bit more here and there. Again, I'm not being precise. Everywhere where there's not blue, it now looks like there's light hitting it, right? So the blues are the shadows. And if you guys do have any questions uh, for me right now while I'm just popping this blue in, this would be a great time to ask. James well. on YouTube would like to know if you're going to ink in the lines after the watercolor dries. Here's the beautiful thing. You can or you don't have to. Uh, so if you want to ink your lines in, you absolutely can do so. Um, it's not a necessity though. So if you decide that you like it as it is once you get all your uh, washes of watercolor in, you can leave it. That's the beauty of doing the art. Um, me personally, I probably won't, but if you are somebody who prefers the hard edge of like a, an inked line, I can see how that would be very, very pretty with the, uh, all the different kind of image or the imagery going on. And I will say if you are going to, uh, ink it, thicker lines to your foreground, well, with some variation, of course, once you go through, uh, to like the mountain range back here, you want a really thin line. Um, cause the, the thicker your line is, the more it's going to be brought to the foreground, um, and kind of pop in, in your face kind of a thing. So you might want to keep the, the back lines a little bit softer. All right. So there's my blue. I did do all of my shadows all throughout the whole landscape, right? Reason why is because that's going to give me the continuity, right? I'm just going to continue it along. Now I need to definitely darken the ones that are up forward. And I'm going to kind of try and move a little faster here. And I'm going to be a little bit more sloppy with it. I'm sorry. Uh, just because I don't want to run out of time because I want to pick up that, um, that masking fluid for you guys. And show you how 
to do the balloons. So, so the more of that darker pigment, again, it looks like a darker shadow and it's bringing it more forward. So, there we go. Now I'm going to pop in my olive green because there's a lot of green in this image, right? And I definitely want to pop that in before I get too far. Again, I do want that to be a lighter wash. Now what's great is that if you really wanted to, you could just kind of go over the whole thing, you know? You don't have to be precise with it, but as you go further back, less pigments. As you go further forward, you want more. More of that saturation, and I'm going to pop that in all the way across, right? Let me pick this up. Again, I have a clean, clean brush, and I'm picking up most of the water on my, um, my rag here so that it's kind of dry, and then I will pick up a lot of that pigment as I brush across it there but I am going to put in more pigments down here. Woo, that was too much, too much, too much. So here's what you do when that happens. Again, cleaning off my brush, I'm pulling off most of the water. Big brush strokes. I don't wanna activate a bunch of that blue underneath, but that's okay, right? And I'm gonna bring in a little bit of that yellow ochre and dance that in as well. So just getting really light and I'm just using the edge of it just to kind of zigzag it back and forth. Unless I get to a little area where there's more of like a sloping kind of rocky area and I will kind of let my brush follow along in the same manner. The further I go back, the more all of that kind of just blends together. And I'm going to just keep going back and forth up here. It's a big chunk of almost like sandy area right here. So I'm going to also pop in a bunch of that. And then all these little rocks. And also I want everyone to give a good round of applause for Ming, who is following my crazy brush marks all around with the camera. Thank you so, so much. <laughs> Making us have the best views. All right, so again, I'm not perfectly copying what's going on in my image. I'm just kind of drawing inspiration from it. Um, now I do want to, before I peel off the masking fluid, I wanna get more of that olive green, the saturation on my brush here. And I wanna get the foreground really saturated. All right, and just a couple places here and there, just to kind of give the hint of, you know, one area has more grass than the other over here. Cause so there's a big sandy area. And then like, maybe these are little trees and bushes. I'm not giving details because if I put details down there, I have to put it in everywhere, right? Just little brush marks, right? Little, little dabs everywhere. And it will kind of hint at what's going on. Do you know exactly what's going on? No, no, you don't. Do we have a question? A couple. Um, okay. One, what attracts you personally to the four by ten block? It's such an un unusual, yeah, uh, size. That's why. Specific, uh, yeah, that's exactly why. Is it's it's an unconventional size, and every time I end up seeing uh, something that's long and skinny, either this orientation or even maybe. Uh, vertically. I do a lot of paintings like this. Like we have uh, the edge canvases that we just got in that are real tall and skinny and you can do either orientation 
and I just love them. It makes you really think about your composition as you're using it kind of a thing. Um, and it, it, if you use it correctly, it looks stunning. And it's always visually interesting. You know? That's, that's really why. Do we have another question? Yes. I'm as sure we... you're working now, yes. um, are you working wet into wet or wet on dry? Uh, it's a little bit of both. That's a really good question. So um, sometimes I'm doing wet on wet because I will get, and I'm going to actually put a little bit of this lemon yellow in with my my olive green just to make it a little brighter, a little bit more of a bright kind of leafy green there. If you, if you guys can see that. Um, so right here, I just got it really wet. I'm going to actually touch in just a little bit of that. So if I want my brush stroke to be nice and soft, I will do wet and wet. Now it's water, it's going to evaporate and it's going to dry. If I let it fully dry and I don't keep working back into those little areas, um, it's going to be eventually, uh, I'm, I'm working on dry paper again, right? Um, so that'll give me the harsh edges. So when it comes to doing landscapes, you want your, your more harsh edges towards the foreground and you want your softer edges, it, you want it to get softer as it goes back. That'll push it back into atmospheric space, right? Um, same thing with the saturation and getting your darkest darks kind of up in the foreground. Uh, when it comes to the hard and soft edges, if you make a hard edge and you decide that you don't like it, again, take a clean brush, get most of the water off and just kind of soften it with a brush stroke or two. Don't scrub at it because the more you scrub at it, the more of that kind of pigment you're going to pick back up and it's going to be a little bit more difficult to kind of get it to go back to where you wanted it to. Uh, but the wool, I will say this is 100% cotton paper. It can take a beating. <laughs> So if you do scrub it a little too much, um, what you can do is at that point, just let it dry, fully let it dry, and then go back into it. Um, but here's the other thing I love to do. I have all these colors on my palette, right? I'm going to make mud. It's going to be pretty mud. But I'm going to make, if I mix all of these kind of colors together, I tend to get a nice neutrally browned. It also helps me clean my palette. Uh, and then in these darker areas, I can take that neutrally brown and just kind of darken everything. And it's not an exact color because whatever I got on my palette is what I got on my palette. And uh, it's kind of how I pull that from being a really bright blue shadow down into it's just now like a shadow. It reads as a shadow, so it's less of like a blue, purple, and more of like a, a more neutrally kind of color, right? Just like that. Now, I can keep going on this and I can keep pulling in that saturation and I would do probably more four, five more layers on top of this just to get it to kind of really highly saturate it. And again, this, I broke my rules and I forgot what I was doing and I got really saturated back here and I wanted to pick that back up, but I really want to show you kind of how to do the balloons. So I know we have one question real quick and I'm going to let this dry so that I can do the, uh, the uh, kneaded eraser and pick up the masking fluid and show you guys kind of how to do that and then approach balloons. But what's your question? Ralph would like to know how to not make blooms. How to not make blooms. Um, don't overwork your watercolor. Uh, also, less water. If you work with less water on your palette, you're less likely to make those blooms. Because a bloom is where you have a lot of pigment and a lot of water over here, and that pigment's trying to follow the water. The pigment wants to kind of creep up to the water. And controlling those blooms, some kind, it can be really fun, and you can get some really interesting things happening. And I would suggest if you are finding that you have too many blooms in your watercolors, go through like a basic techniques. Try to do the washes. Try to do um, different layers where you kind of glaze one on top of the other. Do the wet and wet kind of technique. Do a dry on wet, or uh, I'm sorry, the, the wet on dry technique. And start practicing your basic brush strokes and really hone in on what happens when you get those blooms. Like if you're all of a sudden trying to do that big gradient of the sky and you have a bizarre bloom, that's because you came back in and started working that 
uh, with a bunch of water and it's now trying to follow the follow the water and move around um, so if you then practice those techniques you're going to find that you can control it a little bit more which controlling water is one of the hardest things ever watercolors are difficult they really they really are in like the best kind of way like it's it's so fun so I don't want to like turn anybody off to, to using watercolors but like you are trying to control water so give yourself a little bit of grace you know um, now this still isn't fully dry so I'm going to actually use a hair dryer I'm sorry this is gonna be a little loud maybe not super loud I don't want it to get super warm because that's not fun um, with the masking fluid. Uh, masking fluid is, is latex, so it, I don't know what happens when that gets really, really toasty. It might move on. Yeah, I don't know. Never really gotten that, that warm. Um, but this right here is the rubber cement pickup. This is what I was trying to call the kneaded eraser earlier. This is essentially just a block of rubber. Um, doesn't really have much flex to it, but it is a little flexible. Uh, this uh, essentially attracts all the masking fluid. Now you could pick this up by hand if you don't have a rubber cement pickup, but in the uh, teacher's cart, I believe I have the kit where it has the masking fluid, the brushes, and the cement pickups all in one for really good price, if I remember correctly. Uh, when you buy all of it in that little pack, they're nice and discounted too. So you can get all of it and have it all taken care of. So I'm going to actually start, uh, let's go to that side camera so I can really show you here uh, before I start picking this up, All right? Let me start here in this corner because I know I have my balloons here and I'm just going to kind of touch it. Uh, what? Bring it, down a bit. Bring it down a little bit, sorry. Uh, they're trying to all mime to me. Um, okay, is that good? Can you guys see that really well? It's hard to see if that's on camera. Keep going. Keep going. Right there. Yay, there we go. Okay, so I'm going to start here. So I'm just going to touch it and just kind of roll forward. Not scrub at it, but that's essentially the motion you want to do is that you're just really touching the masking fluid and kind of gumming it off. And like you saw that, it sticks to the rubber mask or the rubber cement pickup and the whole thing of masking fluid pops right off. Now, uh, the reason why you want to do this when your watercolor is completely dry is because if you do this before it's completely dry, you are going to scrub your paper, it's going to pill, and it's going to damage the uh, colors that you put down already. Um, now this is, it's, I just hit it with a hair dryer, so I'm a little hesitant, but I am going to be trying to work on this a little faster because I'm going to probably only get to a couple of balloons. To be honest, I feel like we're gonna run out of time. Um, but let me pull all the masking fluid off here. Also, pull off the masking fluid only when you are 100% sure the background is done. Once you pull that masking fluid off, you can put it on again, but it's gonna be really hard to get it in the exact same spot that you had it before. Um, so just make sure that you're 100% done with the background before you pop it off. Now, when you get to all of the masking fluid is off and you think it's all gone, just run your hand along your paper. If you feel any like little rubber bits or anything, you missed a spot. <laughs> um, but I got it all off and there you go. So now, all of my balloons are still perfectly white. Let me make sure that's on camera. Um, because uh, that masking fluid will not let anything get through it. Uh, and I made sure to really coat all of my little balloons, even the li little ones over here, which are really hard to see. <laughs> They're tiny little dots, but I did mask them off. Um, that, that round masking fluid um, brush really gets good detail like that. So. Uh, this is the point where I actually don't even think I used my uh, six flat. I would have gone in with that for the, the other details here, but 
I need to do a couple of balloons for you guys before we get too far. Now I'm going to start with the blue, just as my shadows, just as I did. And let me actually do a couple of these bigger ones here so you can really see what I'm doing. Um, this I'm going to use, because remember the light is coming in from this direction, right? So I'm gonna use my, my round uh, brush here and just kind of hit, I got a little bit more pigment there, this side of the balloon. Now, if you look at the balloon up close, you can see there are a couple indicators of kind of where the balloon kind of has these folds that go in and out. Since this is much further in the foreground and it's closer to the viewer, I want to put just a little bit more detail in there than all the other kind of areas down here in the, the way in the background, right? Uh, and I'm going to do that for all of them. I'm going to just work on a few of these here, though, right here in this little area. So I will work on each little balloon separately. Now, this is a rounded object, so don't forget your basic shading techniques of where your core shadow is, where the highlight is, things like that. You're just doing it in watercolor, right? So let me do this one because I know those are still technically drying. And because I have a nice pointy brush, I can get all those little details, right? Super cute. Now I'm gonna let that fully dry. Uh, and then I'd go on to the next uh, couple of detail layers where I'm going to start putting in, say, that has a little like red stripey in it. Hopefully this is, yeah, this is dry enough. So even though I have that blue down, if I put a wash of red on there, it's now gonna look like it has a little stripe. And for um, writing, when it comes to that, uh, and actually, let's go to the side camera because then I can make sure this is really in, in view here. Let me, right? Something like that. There you go. Hopefully that's in, in, in focus. All right. So this guy right here, there's writing on that balloon, right? Do you see it? When it comes to writing on the balloon, I don't actually write what's there. I just do a uh, little dabbies like this to indicate writing. You cannot read it, it doesn't matter, but it, you can tell that there's some kind of a design, right? And it works, right? Perfect. So um, when it comes to little highlights like on the red area, I might take the red, mix it in with a little bit of the gamboge and just touch it on this side just to kind of indicate a little bit of highlights, right? Same thing in the writing. Uh, and then if I need a little bit of highlight right there, I might do a little bit of that lemon yellow. Now I don't wanna to get too far down because I just touched that red. Uh, so if I do that, that whole thing will blur. Um, but I'm just gonna kind of go around it just to kind of indicate that. Um, and that is how I would do the balloons. Now I might actually take a little bit of my mud that I made, mix it in with the purple. And here, let me do this little shadow right here. So I got purple mixed in with my mud, all the different colors of my palette, right? And if I do that little core shadow, I can layer on top of that blue Actually, let me take that and soften just this edge with a clean, wet brush, and there you go. Now it's got a nice core shadow. How cute is that? So that's exactly how I would approach the balloons. Um, same thing with the little baskets here. I would just touch in just a little bit of color um, if it's this close to the foreground. <clears throat> Excuse me. If it's this close to the foreground, I will show you the highlight side and the darker side, 
that is about as detailed as I get. I have one block of a darker color on this side and then a little bit of like the light area showing over here. I wouldn't get any more detail than that. Um, but that's exactly how I would approach all the little balloons. And then uh, once you're done, make sure you sign it. And uh, there's your little landscape. I don't know how we're doing on time. I feel like we are literally right on time. Oh my gosh, look at me. Uh, do we have questions though? One real quick question. Okay. You get a stray hair on your brush. Mm -hmm. How do you fix it? What do you do with it? Okay, so stray hairs on the brush, it does happen from time to time, whether it is um, just a hair that's sticking out odd from being manufactured that way, or if it's like it happened during a transit, like you know the little sleeves that go over top of your brushes, like if they pinch one hair, you're gonna have that hair that sticks out. What I do is I just take scissors and cut it off. You're never gonna get it to go back into shape with the brush, don't it is, pull it. don't pull it, just snip it at the end as close to the ferrule as you can without cutting any of your other bristles. If you even need to hold those to the side, have that one little hair and then snip it, um, steady hands. <laughs> uh, I've also used a, tiny scissors. yeah, tiny scissors, like little, like, eyebrow scissors or you know something or something sewing tiny scissors. sewing scissors those are really great too small scissors something that is sharp that's not going to be a problem of you kind of trying to cut it so <laughs> any other questions as we go along all right well I am absolutely loving this in comparison to this oh do we have time to try and see if I can lift this out because I did want to show you that guys that real quick um so because I was, I, to be honest, I think I wasn't paying attention to what I was, I, it happens sometimes as artists, you know, we're just not paying attention, we're just on auto mode and we get a little too saturated there. Um, so when it comes to watercolors, uh, the way that I try to fix these things uh, is that I get a wet brush, nice and clean, wet water, uh, no pigments or anything in there, and I get the area wet. And I am going to have to go around my little balloons here. And I'm not scrubbing it. I'm just getting it wet. Because that is at now activating the watercolors that are down, right? I'm going to take an easy wiper. And I'm going to start lifting off that pigment. I don't know if you can tell the difference, but I can. So... If I do this twice, it might be pushed back in at that atmospheric perspective just enough to where I'm not going to be mad that I wasn't paying attention to what I was doing. Um, now I will say, every time you dab with a rag, switch where you're dabbing, otherwise the pigments that you just picked up, you might lay back down in the wrong area. So just to, warn you that that might happen <laughs> because I've done that before and it is incredibly infuriating because now you're trying to pick up pigments that you didn't mean to have there. So, um, but that's, that's exactly how I would do this. And it's not a fast kind of pick up the pigments type of a thing, but, um, it definitely does work and softens those colors quite a bit where they're not as saturated. <laughs> Let's see how much more I can pick it up. Yeah, it's still picking it up, but it's still not as much as I wanted it to be. But that's okay. It's better. I can live with this, you know? So that's how I would fix it. Now, the more you scrub at it, the more pigments you are going to activate and kind of do that. But um, I just, I wouldn't want to lose all those beautiful little colors that I have dancing around in there. I'd rather just pick up a, a little bit of pigment on us at a time. I swear I can talk a little bit of pigment at a time <laughs> and then um, keep those sections of color instead of scrubbing it and then mixing them all together and making mud. Um, but that, that's a watercolor landscape. I hope that you guys get a chance to try this. It is super fun. Uh, and if you definitely do try this, please post it 
to our Jerry's Live Facebook group on Facebook. Uh, I just said Facebook twice. That's great. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely feels like a Monday. I don't know why. But make sure you guys post it. I would love to see what you create. Thank you so much for watching. And again, uh, join me next week because we're going to have a really awesome show. I'm really excited for this. We have a brand new black primed canvas, and I'm going to show you guys how to use it. So it's going to be a lot of media and a lot of fun. So I hope to see you guys then. Bye.